one of the things I like about the way black folk worship that we just whatever's going on we just add our little bit to it like gumbo just throw something else in the pot and uh, I heard Charles now the late Charles Booth said he said that this religion began with the Jews is the Jews created it and the Romans legalized it the Germans divided it. The English uh, popularized it. Uh, Americans standardized it. But it took black folk to glorify it. <laughs> hey man, ain't no harm in, in groaning. Hey, the Bible says the Holy Spirit understands groanings too deep for words. Amen. Best cooking in the world to make you groan. How is it? Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> Best looking person in the world to make you groan. What he look like? Ooh. Mm. 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 <laughs> Keep my mind, Jesus. Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be made acceptable in thy sight, O God. You are our strength and our redeemer. Bless us now, God, in the preaching of your word. And let your word go forth, never to come back void, but accomplish the purpose for which it is sent. In the name of Christ, we pray, God, and we give you thanks. Let us all say together, amen. amen. Would you stand all over the house and turn with me? To the very first chapter of the gospel as recorded by St. Luke. The very first chapter of the gospel as recorded by St. Luke. And I did get the memo from the general as to the dress code for the morning so that I would look like I belonged in the picture. <laughs> Amen. Uh, particularly sensitive to detail when women's choir is up because you don't want to cross the general. <laughs> Say amen, choir. <laughs> amen. I want to read some very iconic and familiar words coming from... Um, 26 through the 38th verses. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, 
to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, quote, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. And how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she, who was said to be barren in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. Well, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be done to me as you will have said. Then the angel left her. Scripture, as it is written, it is always our prayer that God would bless us in the reading and the hearing of his most holy word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord and each other. I don't know if you can see it, but not just my tie, Deneen, but my cufflinks are pink too. So shows you how scared of her I am. <laughs> Take your neighbor by the hand, somebody who's within arm's reach. Say to them, friend, promises and pledges are easier said than done. That's my subject this morning. Easier said than done. At the 1962 National Baptist Convention, young Martin Luther King Jr., Step to the podium with the envy and jealousy filled president of the National Baptist Convention, J.H. Jackson, standing over his shoulder. And he said, among other things, the end in life is not to be happy, but to do God's will. Remember nothing else about this sermon. Wrap your mind around that statement. Flung into the abyss of history. The end in life. Not to be happy. But to do God's will. And Martin King knew exactly what he was saying. When he made that statement. It was not abstract to him. Oftentimes we say things. We have no idea what we're saying. Because we have no experience to match the words. Yeah. Lord, I make a way. But we've never been through anything. Just words. Hang on in there. But we've never gone through anything. Just words. It wasn't just words for Martin. He's a 26-year-old PhD. Recipient from Boston University. When he took on the job as the pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. His vision for his life was that he would spend countless hours in the safe sanctuary of the pastor's study, preparing his sermons, writing his books, and pinning addresses that he would give out on the lecture circuit. And then, in his own words, he would be tracked down by the Zietgeist, the German for spirit of the times, as he found himself leading the Montgomery Improvement Association, a bus boycott triggered by 
Rosa Parks not giving up her seat on a bus for a white man. And suddenly the charmed existence he had planned for himself was snatched away forever. And in the words of one of the elderly women who were part of that great campaign where black folks, 50,000 of them, walked together for 381 days. Imagine that. Something overrode our crabs in a barrel mentality. And black folks got on the same page and walked together for 381 days. Now that's a miracle right there. Black folk walked together for 381 days. And he led that movement because as one of the senior women in those mass demonstrations said to him, son, you done went up there and got all that education. Now you need to bring yourself down here and help your people in these streets. And from then on, Martin King's charmed existence was snatched away from him. And in the midst of that movement, his house was firebombed and his wife, Coretta, and the oldest daughter at the time, Yolanda, barely escaped death. 1958 at a book signing in Harlem, signing the book, The Montgomery, uh, the Montgomery Story. He was stabbed in the chest by a demented woman and a blade laid right on his aorta artery. And he would say in his sermon later, if he had but sneezed, he would have died. And while he had no idea what was going to happen on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel on April 4th, 1968, when an assassin's bullet would pierce his frame and silence the silvery tongue of his oratory and leave nothing but his dreams still alive, he had lived through enough to know he would live the remainder of his life in the shadow of death. And he had to make the decision would he remain faithful to God, even though the things that he thought would make him happy would no longer be within his reach? But for him, the end of life was not to be happy, but to do God's will. He knew exactly what he was saying when he spoke those words, which is more than what we could say for the young prepubescent Mary who had no idea what she was signing on to when she spoke her now iconic words, be it unto me, Lord, according to thy will. That's how it reads in the King James. Mary, like us, would live to learn that when it comes to keeping, making and keeping big promises and pledges in life, that they're much easier said than done. They're much easier made than kept. To love and to cherish, not love and tolerate, but to love and to cherish in sickness and in health, or should I say in health and even in sickness, in wealth and even in poverty, and keep thee only unto you. So long as we both shall live. That is much easier said. Than done. Elected officials place one hand on the Bible. And raise the other one up. And pledge to defend. Promote. The Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Even if the enemies are if one's own party. Even if the polls say that to impeach those who run roughshod over that Constitution, uh, that if you support impeachment that you may not get elected, they find that it's much easier said than done. Christians in local churches, little places, little people like you and me from the pulpit to the door, get saved, come up out the baptism pool. We all on fire for the Lord, drunk with the Holy Spirit, and we're going to be faithful to God because I love the Lord, L-A-W-D. 
We sing that song, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Oh, yes, I'm on the battlefield for the Lord. And I promised him that I, I promised him that I, I promised him that I would serve him till I die. Because I'm on the battlefield for the Lord. I was alone and idle. I was a sinner too. I heard the voice of heaven saying there is work to do. I took my master's hand. I joined the Christian band. Now I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Oh, yes. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I promised him that I, I promised him that I, I promised him that I would serve him till I die. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Because when I met my Savior, I met him with a smile. He healed my wounded spirit on me as I child. And now in distant lands I trod, saying, sinner, come to God. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Oh, yes, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I promised him that I, even when there's a game on would serve him till I die. I'm on the battle field for my Lord. Much easier said than done when other stuff is pulling at your money and you got to pay your tithes. Much easier said than done to be faithful to your ministry commitment when folk are telling you let's run out of town for the weekend. Or do you really want to be on the hook week in and week out? I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. It's much easier said than done. To come to church on a regular basis when I could catch up on some sleep or grade some papers. It's much easier said than done. When we find that to live above with the saints I love, that would be like glory. But now to live below with the saints I know, now that's a different story. I promised him that I would serve him till I die, turning the other cheek, going the extra mile. And then I joined the parking ministry and folk cuss you out because you asked them to back up and get between the lines. And then them folk go into service and shout like they caught the Holy Ghost after just cussing me out in the parking lot. It's easier said than done. I'm going to be a better parent than my parents was to me, and I'm going to correct all the mistakes that they made. I'm going to love my children unconditionally and show them a better way. It's much easier said than done. You're a school teacher, I'm going to be the best teacher, and I'm going to work with all my students, even the ones that are struggling. I'm going to work with all the parents and develop a relationship and have good communication. And all my students are going to excel and they're going to go on to college. And then you run into them little monsters. <laughs> and they're world star crazy behind parents. And you want to smack them up where they act up. It's much easier said. Then done. And I come to tell you, young Mary, I've seen this passage preached so many times. And because we know the outcome of the story, we act like she knew at the beginning what was going to happen in the end. And the reality is Mary had no idea what she was obligating herself to. But what you... She had no idea what she was obligating herself to when she essentially made the pledge to the angel of the Lord, be it unto me, according to your will. Lord, whatever you want to do, my storage is empty. I'm available to you. I'm yours, Lord, everything I got. Everything I am, even what I'm not, I'm yours, Lord. Try me now and see. See if I can be completely yours. Who among us here hasn't been in church long enough where you haven't made a big, bold, shining promise to God about what you're going to do because you're so grateful, you're so thankful. Now you're going to be different from everybody else. Or you're going to be different now. We've made them big, bold pledges to the Lord. Only to live to learn. Pledges are much easier said than done. But what would you have expected Mary to say? I mean when a terrestrial servant of God, winged and sword, sheathed or unsheathed, come from the very counsel of God, dispatched with infinite speed to track you down, 
The celestial and the terrestrial commune is one and stands before Mary, a 12 to 16 year old girl, to tell her, you about to get pregnant. Without knowing the pleasures of a man. And the Holy Spirit's going to overshadow you. So the Holy Spirit's going to do to you what a man would normally do to you. And the, that which is conceived of that is going to be called the Son of God. It says that she feared and trembled. He told her, be not afraid. You have found favor with God. This don't sound like no favor, but be it unto me, Lord, according to your will. What would you expect her to say in the presence of the eternal? I ain't trying to hear that. <laughs> Talk to the hand. What do you say when someone puts a gun to your head except capitulate to whatever they say? Put a gun to your head. You think I'm nice looking? I think you're beautiful. <laughs> but she had no idea what she was signing on to when she made the promise. She would live to learn what was involved in it. When a child would be born. And when Caesar Augustus would decree that everyone would go to the city of their birth and be registered, and Joseph of the line of David would have to go to the city of Bethlehem and by their ancient means of travel, she laid into the pregnancy on a mule, a beast of burden, as we have characterized it. We don't know for sure. They make their way to Bethlehem and being a poor peasant carpenter, his cash would only give him access to an abandoned stable, a barn. And there was no fluffy crib. There was just the feed box that the cattle ate from called a manger. There was no fluffy blanket. There was just the strips of linen and cloth that they used to bandage the wounds of beasts. And so they wrapped them up. A hideous sight. A newborn bloody baby just wrapped up in, in scraps of, of cloth laying in a feed box for a manger amidst the stench of animal droppings no anesthesia no she felt all those contractions no midwife joseph fumbling and bumbling around thinking i think i got it how do i cut the cord she had no idea that after the baby would be born he'd be born against the backdrop of the wailing of he jewish mothers because herod a jealous king by roman appointment a tetrarch meaning the he was the ruler of a partial kingdom as the kingdom was divided up and the Herod family were given pieces of the kingdom and he had the region of Judea and he was a proselyte Jew, which means he wasn't born a Jew. He converted to Judaism and he was a pawn of the Roman Empire to rule the Jewish people who only respected and would acknowledge a king who came through the Davidic line. And according to their calculations, he was about to be born. So he decided he's going to kill all Jewish male babies two years of age and younger. It echoed the background of what happened when Moses was born. When all Jewish babies were killed on the birthing stool. But those Hebrew women defied Pharaoh. So Moses could be born. And while against the backdrop of the wailing of Hebrew mothers... Jesus, then Mary and Joseph had to take flight and become refugees like people from Nicaragua and Honduras now, fleeing home, trying to find safer environs, and they found it in Egypt. And they hid out till God took care of Herod. Because of this child, be it unto me, Lord. Now I got to go on the road. I got to go on the run and brave the hazards of the hot sands of Palestine, hoping to find safety and sanctuary in Egypt and hope Egypt will treat me better than the United States is treating refugees today. Much easier said than done. Then after Herod died, they tried to go back home. They were warned in a dream. Well, no, you can't go back to Judea. Go to Galilee, a third grade province off the beaten path and a town called Nazareth that's so remote. It's not even mentioned in the Old, Old Testament because whereas Herod was bad, he was succeeded by his son Archelaus and he was even worse than his father. Like father, like son. Archelaus was Herod 2.0. So they got to grow up in a remote place in the back. Who the heck wants to live in a Nazareth? But you got to because of this baby. Much easier said than done. And then when he was a boy, you got to put up with things like when they had to go annually up to Jerusalem for the Passover. 
and it's a day's journey by foot. And they go there, dirt deacon polite, and then they headed back home and they find out Jesus ain't with them. They look among the relatives, can't find them. Now they got to backtrack, go back to Jerusalem, day's journey by foot. No cell phones, no calling ahead, no texting to see if he's there. Anybody who's ever had, anybody who's had kids, you know that moment when you realize your child is not there? There's a word beyond terrified that describes that feeling when you cannot locate your child. You go to the mall and look around, you think they're behind you and you can't find them. You're in absolute terror until you can identify the whereabouts of your child. It was a day's journey back to Jerusalem. And then it says once they got there, it took them three days to find them. Three days of cortisone uh, and adrenaline pumping in their veins at a wide-eyed glare, wondering where is my baby at, only to find him in the temple. And they saw him sitting there interacting casually with the, 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 the temple priests and scribes, and it flings from their mouth, how can you treat us this way? That's the Bible's toned-down way of saying, Negro, have you lost your mind? The Bible's polite, but just plop yourself in the story and imagine what you would have said if you found your child sitting out, kicking it, chilling in the temple when for three days you haven't known where that narrow behind was. She didn't sign up for all this. This was far more than what she reckoned with. And then there's that, that experience when he performed the first miracle according to the Johannine witness at the marriage feast when the wine ran out. Oh, that may mean nothing to you and us and our Western orientations, but in Jewish ceremonies then, and in some places even now, the wine represented, it was the fluid of life, and it represented the fertility of the couple because the whole point in Jewish community and getting married was to have babies. It was about the posterity. It was not, marriages were arranged. It wasn't about love. It was about family and posterity. They said, blessed is the man whose quiver is full. So how many children you had was symbolic of how much favor you had with God. Plus in the rural culture, the more hands to, 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 to work the fields. And so when the wine ran out, it was a bad omen. It, this stuff was real. It, was, it wasn't about refreshments. It was about symbolism. It was about providence. It was a bad omen when the wine ran out that this couple's not going to have any children. They're going to be infertile. So she comes to Jesus because, according to the Johan eyewitness, he hasn't performed any great miracles yet, but she's seen enough to know that weird stuff happens with this boy. And we've gone through, we done, we, we've been chased, we've been refugees, and, and, and that, that temple mess that went on, and all these sacrifices we've had to make. I've seen enough to know that there's enough potential in him. He ought to be able to do something about this situation. He goes to Jesus and says, can you, the wine done ran out. Can you do something about that? And he says to her in very cold in formal terms, woman, my time is not yet. Now, again, plop yourself in the story and you go to your child that you've invested a lot in and now you need a little reciprocation and all that parental investment and they're going to say to you, dude, woman, cold and informal because now he doesn't jump from her son to son of God, woman. My time is not yet. And you can tell she's a sister because she totally dismisses what he says as if talked to the hand and turns to the servants and says, uh, whatever Jesus says, you do it. In other words, I already just said, but he's about to do something. After all I've gone through, no, this nigga going to do something. He owe me that. He about to do something. His time ain't yet. No, it's time. And apparently, even in the economy of God, mamas have leverage. Because Jesus then said, okay, 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 fill them pots, them big jars with water, and then take them to the host. 
And sometimes, somewhere between the time they filled those jars and they took them to the host, that water was turned to wine. In the same way, when Jesus would lay his hands on the leper and said, now go to the priest and let him certify you whole. And when they left Jesus, they had leprosy. But by the time they got to the priest, they were made whole. They were healed on the journey. Somewhere between the time they filled those pots in obedience to Jesus and they got to the husband, they turned from water to wine and it drew out. He says, you have saved the best for last. And then what about the day when they, when, when, when Aaron, Jesus, Mama Mary, and, and the other kids wanted Jesus for something, but he was doing a Bible study. He was always doing Bible studies in the crowds around him. She needed him for something, and she went to him, and they said, Jesus, your mama, Mary and them is out there, and he then rebuked and said, who is my mother? Sisters and brothers, such disrespect. Who is your mama? After all, I be, who is your mama? Who is your daddy? After all I've been through, who is my mother, sisters and brothers, except whoever does the will of God? Except if they out there, let them stay out there. They should have been in here in the first place, interrupted me. Oh, it was much easier said than done. She didn't sign up for all this. She had no idea that being the mother of this child was going to be involved, was going to involve all of this. And then, of course, we haven't even talked about that day after he was arrested. We're not even talking about that day when after the disciples scattered like roaches when the raid is sprayed. And nobody's left but Mary and the other Mary Magdalene from the village of Magdala, who was seven demons until the Lord touched her. And Joanna... And a few others followed him as they slapped him all night in the barracks. And then one of them frustrated soldiers went outside and found a briar bush and unsheathed his sword and cut loose some briars and then contorted it into a cross, a mock cross, and shoved it on his head, gouging his scalp, droplets of blood running down his face. Much easier said than done when you watch your child convicted in a kangaroo court on trumped up charges condemned to death by Romans torturous means of death put him on the flogging rack ripping away chunks of flesh creating canals of blood that ran down much easier said than done than when they strip him down to a loincloth Hoist upon his back an old rugged cross stained with the blood of previously condemned men. Much easier said to done it when you watch your son in so much pain he's in delusion as he stumbles down the Fide della Rosa till he collapses under the weight of the cross, only to be spared of some of its weight by the other brother from Cyrene, Simeon, who cares, carries that cross while Jesus staggers outside the gates of the city up to the hill of Skull. Much easier said than done it when you watch your baby laid on a cross and someone take a mallet and take a spike and smash it through his hands and feet, crushing bone, ripping tissue, splattering blood, hearing his god-awful shrieks and cries for mercy that never came. Much easier said than done as they dropped that cross in a hole. They stretched him high and they they lifted him high and stretched him wide. As he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, the lama say, Thak, then I, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Much easier said than done as you watch your son lay his head in the locks of his shoulder. And the whole earth goes into convulsion. The sun refuses to shine. As the sun won't shine because the sun is dying. Oh, it's much Easier said than done. But she made a pledge and a vow. The question before us is what do we do when not Mary the mother of Jesus, but Braxton and Polite and Smith and Carware and Harris and Grant and all the rest of us What do we do in those moments, those crossroad moments in life when it appears that God's will for our lives, and sometimes we don't know what God's will is, but then there are other times when we do know. 
We have some sense of reasons God brought us in this life and his general expectations for us as his disciples. What do we do in those crossroad moments where God's manifest will for our lives and the things we think will bring us joy, happiness, and fulfillment just don't line up? What do we do? How do we find the strength to keep our promises? Because our lives are really organized around the promises we make. To family, to vocation, to nation, to God. Our lives are organized around the big promises we make with no idea what's coming down the road. And yet there are things that we think will bring us joy, bring us fulfillment, bring us pleasure, Bring us happiness, and what do we do when we get to those moments of crossroad? Where the promises we've made out of a sense of God's will for our lives and the things that make us happy, they just don't cohere. How do we find the strength to keep our promises? And by what means do we gain peace with the hard decisions that we have to make? To either endure things that are God awful or to let go of things that make us feel God forsaken. Well, I'll give you two things that I get out your way. Number one, when we find ourselves at the crossroads where we have to choose between happiness and God's will, we have to gain a sense of perspective. On, on our sense of sacrifice. You know, 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, 13 verse said, there's no temptation, no trial put upon us such that is not common to man. We have a way when it seems like life is robbing us of feeling like ain't nobody ever gone through this. Ain't nobody ever had to put up with this, that our pain is uniquely severe. And we need to gain the perspective. Sometimes we're so close to the forest, we can't see the trees. And we need to back up and realize, you ain't the only one who's had to be at odds with themselves. You ain't the only one who's ever felt ripped down the middle by the claims and the calls of God on your life. And perspective helps us terminate the internal pity party that we go through um, by considering the far greater sacrifices of, of, of others. I'm, I've often quoted to you because it, it resonates with me, the, the, the poem of, of Fanny Crosby who was blinded in her infancy by a bootleg doctor who was filling in for the main doctor while he was on his vacation and used a, a, a wrong prescription for uh, an infection that requires simply a regular eye solve. And, and she lost her sight for life. And But she would say when she was nine years old, a soaring intellect, and speak out of her blindness, she would say, what a happy soul I am, although I cannot see. I have resolved that in this life contented I will be. So many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. Now, I had to recently plot my own situation in those circumstances. God spoke to me through that poem in the early weeks of this ordeal that I went through when this infection set up on my body and this surgery went bad and, and, and suddenly there were multiple emergency surgeries and, and, and trying to figure out what type of infection and customize an, an antibiotic for it. And in those days, well, my greatest fear is I'm going to lose this leg or it ain't never going to be the same again. And, and, and pain that I'd never experienced has sent me literally into stages of delirium and between the fear and the pain. And, and, and I remember my, the weekend of my mother's 80th birthday party when family was in town and they all, after service, besieged my hospital room and I expressed to them my fear of losing my leg and someone had the unmitigated gall to say well even if you do you can still live a full life and I was not trying to hear that and I told them in no uncertain terms without hesitation reservation or equivocation my understanding of abundant life does not mean being an amputee 
I am LDB from the hilltop in Tacoma. I go to the gym. I throw Frisbee in the summertime. I run. I'm not going to be no one-legged man. If the Lord take my leg, he's going to have to take all of me because when they bury this body, they're going to bury it whole, and I meant every word of it. You mean to tell me? I said, listen, y'all live your life the way you want to live it, how I want to live mine. I'm the only Negro in this room who has a vote. And what makes me happy? And I could care less what the rest of you think. And then I had to think about what Fanny Crosby said. To weep and sigh, if it had come to it. To weep and sigh, Victor, because I've lost my leg. While I go to therapy three times a week. And it does not yet appear how much I will recover. Will I be as good as I was before? Will I be better? Will I be some lesser version than I was before? To weep and sigh because I cannot, may not be able to do some of the things that in the past made me happy. Can I still keep my pledges to stay on the battlefield for the Lord if I have to limp on that battlefield? To weep and sigh because I limp. I have yet to say I cannot and I won't. But I'm still wrestling with the right question. And I'm not going to lie to you this morning. It was much easier when I got my ordination certificate to say, Lord, use me, Lord, however you want to use me. I'm yours, Lord. Come what may. Long as I got Jesus, I got enough. I had no idea then what was coming down the road. That pledge was much easier said than done. But by considering the far greater sacrifices of others, it puts it in perspective. Is my love for the Lord less than a nine-year-old blind girl? Is it that the Lord has to give me more or is it that I have to grow up more? Is it that the Lord has to give you more? Or is it that you have to grow up more? How do we keep our promises? Secondly, I told you there's only two things I'm going to let you go. We have to play the long game. By the long game, I'm talking about the game of legacy. See, when we're pursuing happiness, that's the short game. That really is here and now. And most of the things we define as those things that make us happy, they really don't matter in the long run. They really don't have any long-term value or long-term significance. Legacy is about the long game. How our lives will be remembered and, and the lasting impact even when we're gone. How many of you have been watching this, the, the miniseries on epics, The Godfather of Harlem, starring um, Forrest Whitaker? If you haven't, get epics and watch it. Is worthy. You will binge on it. Once you watch the first episode, you won't be able to put it down. It's about Bumpy Johnson, who ran the drug trade through Harlem in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And um, he has this strange friendship with Malcolm X. And there's a scene where Malcolm X is trying to get Bumpy Johnson, who's running the drug trade through Harlem, and Malcolm in the Fruit of Islam is trying to get control of some of the corruption in Harlem and, and some of the uh, injustice in the housing units, and he's, and he's trying to have some political impact, and so he's trying to get Bumpy Johnson to be more than a drug dealer, and he says to him, he says, listen, uh, Bumpy, he says, 
Every man has a legacy, be it good or bad. Everybody in here is going to have a legacy, be it good or bad. And uh, sometimes we have to think about how we're going to be remembered. What's going to be the lasting impact of our lives? Dr. Matalo, who is one of the tour guides in the slave castles in West Africa and Ghana, where Shell and I visited last year, he told us as we went through the horrifying tour through the slave castles and the point of no return, he said all captured Africans resisted in one of three ways. He said, some jumped overboard and refused to subject themselves to the indignities of a life of bondage. He said, some ran away or led insurrections. He said, then others just simply made the decision to survive, believing that if they survived, they were giving the gods the opportunity to make wrong right in future generations. And then when you think about that, my mind thinks about Kunta Kinte. He was a young man captured by slave catchers, going out to get an animal, to skin it, to make a drum. His family would never see him any, anymore. Raised in freedom, captured, subject to a life of bondage. Ran away several times, lost his foot. You know the story. And there's, in the movie, it depicts the grown Kunta Kinte, played by um, John Amos, former all-pro linebacker from the Kansas City Chiefs. When Kizzy is born, he takes her up to a hill to perform an African ceremony dedicating the child to say, behold, the only thing greater than yourself. But in the scene prior to that, Kunta Kinte is approached by people from the Underground Railroad who are telling him that the... Underground Railroad is coming through the next couple of days. When you hear this certain pattern on the drums, you know that it is us. Come to the designated spot, and we're going to run to freedom. He had told his slave wife, Belle, about it. Belle was born in slavery. And she didn't want to hear all that stuff about running away. She was conditioned to the life of the plantation. As Kunta Kente was engaging in the ceremony, he heard the sound of the drum, and Bell heard it too back in the slave quarters. He began running best he could with half a foot, running probably about the way I could right now. Sweat rolling down his face, heart pounding. Bell heard it and assumed he was running to meet those who were going in the Underground Railroad, and in all the pain, of plantation life and now her slave husband and daughter Kizzy were going to be taken from her and with her heart pounding and tears rolling all of a sudden the surprise is that Kunta Kente does not run toward those in the Underground Railroad he runs back to the plantation to be with Bell and she said I, I thought you wanted to be free and he said, Bell, I couldn't leave you and take Kizzy from you. And he gave up the freedom that would have made him happy. Because he couldn't rip out Bell's heart. Even though Kizzy would be traded away down the road, they would bear that burden together. And wouldn't you know it, nine generations later, Alex Haley would be born, who would write the autobiography of Malcolm X, and then write the book Roots, which became the subject of the TV series, the first miniseries on TV, which then initiated a flame for black folks in this country, reclaiming African ancestry. That was when black folks started family reunions all over this country. That was when kente cloth came into our churches. 
When I was raised in the early 60s, there was no kente cloth in our churches. We were ashamed of Africa. All them, all them Tarzan movies on TV where one white man can come and rule the jungle. We were ashamed of association with Africa until Roots changed our minds. We took off them old hot choir robes. Folks started bringing in kente cloth. Pastors started preaching in robes um, with, 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 with kente and African insignia. Then the DNA obsession became one to find out where we are. Now white folks are getting DNA tests. Our whole culture in learning your story and finding out where you came from literally can be tracked back to an African. Born in slavery who made the decision to stick with Baal, bring Kizzy back home. Nine generations, God worked it out and made what was wrong right and set a fire for people to be concerned with their history. All I'm trying to tell you is that sometimes when we have to make painful sacrifices and give up happiness for the sake of fulfilling God's will, we're giving God an opportunity to do something with our life even long after we're in the grave. Our life continues to bear fruit John F. Kennedy said in 1961 he said the life of service whether to God or country at the end of the day the life of service is a continual test of the will the life of service is a continual test of the will the life of service every week there's the temptation not to come. Every day there's a te temptation to divert our attention otherwise. Every moment there's something else pulling at us for time, talent, and treasure. Every day there's the temptation to settle for mediocrity rather than excellence. Every day there is the pull to say yes to our baser impulses disregard our higher callings in Christ Jesus. And the question is, where are we today in relationship to those promises? Be it unto me, Lord, according to your will. That's what we said. That's what we said. Have thine own way, Lord, with or without children. Have thine own way, Lord, even if one of my children dies. Have thine own way, Lord, even if I'm less than what I used to be. Have thine own way, Lord, even if God assigns me to some outpost of the empire. But my light can barely shine. Have thine own way, Lord, even if my children don't come out right. The way I think of right, have thine own way, Lord. Even if loneliness is my daily companion and they return hate for my love. I did promise him. I did promise him. And you did promise him. To serve him till we die. We did promise. We did promise. But it's so much easier said than done. Take your neighbor by the hand. Lord, right here, right now, I pray that you bless my neighbor. I don't know what promises they've made. But I know promises are much easier made than kept. And so right now, God, I pray that you apportion my neighbor grace. To be faithful in the face of the hard choices and challenges and sacrifices. Nobody told us the road would be easy. And none of us knew what was coming down the road when we sat upon it. But right here and right now, God, 
I pray that you'll portion my neighbor grace and then Lord while on others thou art calling do not pass me by as each of us sit here in the uniqueness of our own life the specificity of our life's details and the private burdens that and battles that we sh that we have we pray dear Lord that you would Give us what we need so that we can keep the pledges and promises that we've made. Catch the tears that fall when we have to endure the unthinkable or to release that which was cherished but in your way. Walk alongside us. And let us hear you say again and again and again, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the world. This is our prayer, God. And if there's somebody in here right now, you've been pulling at them, trying to get them to take that walk down that aisle. Give their life to you. Give their life back to you. Set roots in the church. I pray right now, God, you would overshadow them like you overshadowed Mary and break through their defenses so that today they can give you the yes that you've been pulling for. Right here, right now. Right here, right now. Right here, right now. Give us the strength to keep our pledges and promises and give us the strength to make those pledges if someone needs to make a pledge to you right now. This is our prayer, God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Let every heart say together, amen. Stand to your feet and tell the person on both sides of you, I'm going to be praying for you. Come on, say it like you mean it. The doors of the church are open. The doors of the church are open and now we extend an invitation. Yeah, sing that song. They treasure. someone here today who would come as we invite you and offer you Jesus Some folks whosoever will Christ is the answer life has many questions but Christ is the answer if you need a church home come on join our family we ain't perfect but we are persuaded that nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus whosoever will whosoever will you don't have to be perfect fact you can't be perfect but you can but come walk with us as we strive to be faithful whosoever will whosoever will about soul. oh but I decided, I decided to make Jesus to make Jesus come on sing it with him you see the words on the screen sure. sing that through one more time sing that through one more time some folks, some folks would rather have houses and have land. houses and land. Some folks choose some folks silver and gold. Choose silver and gold. But these things they, they treasure. They treasure. Forget about their soul. And forget about their soul. Oh, but I decided. I decided. I decided to make Jesus my soul. Come on, get to that chorus. Get to that chorus. Yeah, the road. The road is rough. How many you know the road is rough? And the going it's rough gets out tough. Here. Yes, it is. And the hills are hard to climb. To climb. I started out a long time I ago. Out this is old school here. A long time ago. Yes, sir. There is no doubt. No doubt. In my mind. I decided. I decided. To make Jesus. To make Jesus. 
come on, sing that chorus again. Sing that chorus again. The road is rough. The road is rough. And the going gets tough. It's an uphill climb. And the hills are hard to climb. Oh, yeah. I started out. It's been a while. A long time ago. But there is no doubt. There is no doubt in my mind. It's a decision. I decided to make Jesus. To make Jesus. Not through with it yet. Sing that chorus again. Sing that chorus again. Somebody needs to hear that. The road is rough. The road is rough. And it's going. And is the tough. going gets tough. It's an uphill climb. And the hills are hard to climb. I started out. I started out. It was a long time ago. A long time ago. But there is no doubt in there my mind. There is no doubt in my mind. I decided. I decided. I decided. I decided. Say it to yourself. I decided. I decided. Go down deep. I've decided. I decided. I decided. I decided. To make Jesus. To make Jesus my joy. Come on, praise him. Come on, praise him.